know you're big time when you go by one name, you know, like Cher or Madonna. Um, well, that's this week's guest. Well, it's really not one name, but there is no last name. Because this week we got Big Gus from Tattoo Nightmares on... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Happy Wednesday, happy hump day. You're halfway through the week. Welcome friends, family, freeloaders, and fishing freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. So welcome to this edition of Mercer. And man, this is going to be a fun one. One thing I promised you guys from the start is, yes, this is a fishing podcast, but we're going to have all sorts of different kinds of guests come on here. And this one's going to be very different. Um... He's from the tattoo world. And before you say, I don't want to hear from some tattoo guy. The one thing all our guests have in common is they love the sport of fishing. And like you hear a lot of people in pro fishing say, I I fish so I can afford to hunt. I'm pretty sure this dude tattoos so he can afford to fish. I mean, grew up in L.A. I mean, when you hear his story, it's amazing. You know, what he's come through and and been part of, but two places that he's always felt home, and that's when he's fishing or when he's doing tattoos. And um, and he's found a way to take – I mean, I met him at a trade show, a fishing trade show, and and he was freaking out about all the fishing people. But if you go to a tattoo trade show with this dude, people are freaking out about him. You know, he was – formerly part of Tattoo Nightmares, which was is still one of the biggest tattoo shows that's ever been on television. Um, very decorated, very awarded tattoo artist. A big deal in the tattoo world, but also a passionate, passionate angler. And one of the amazing things about him, when I first met him, I'm like, that is just a weirdo like me. He's just hyper. He's got ADD. He's all over the place. And... Um, Somehow he figured out a way to make it work in his world. And somehow I figured out a way to make my weirdness work in this world. And today we're going to find out if our weirdness can work together. Because what he's done, what he's taken from the tattoo world and brought to the fishing world is amazing. Um, and you're going to want to hear about this. And then on top of that, he's also an incredible advocate for autism. And this is Autism Awareness Month. We had Cruz on last week. So what better way to finish it off with this week's guest, Big Gus. That's right, Big Gus. I mean, that's all you need to know. You don't need to know a lot. Everybody knows him in the tattoo world. Just tell him Big Gus. So without further ado, all the way from the West Coast, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Big Gus. So I'll be honest right off the top. This is a different one for me. This is a much, much different. I mean, I don't know if anyone's going to listen to this. I mean, you are a <laughs> freaking rock star in the tattoo world. Um, oh, man. And They're like, what is this heavily tattooed guy doing on a fishing podcast? <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's let's tell them what you're doing here. First of all, wh where did this all start? I mean, me and you met literally at a trade show. And yeah, and. You know, you're a fishing freak, but before I we even get to the fishing freak part, let's focus on the freak a little more. <laughs> <laughs> well, this freak, as most people know me, um, I'm known obviously as Big Gus. Now I'm a tattoo artist, very well-known tattoo artist. Uh, I had a very, very popular show, Tattoo Nightmares, which still airs till this day, except I'm like 200 pounds heavy on the show. So what's funny is, is like when people watch the show, they're like, they come and because I have people fly from all over the world to be in my shop, which we're in my shop right now, by the way, you guys, that's why there's a lot of art and stuff in the background. And that's big old Betty from Arkansas striper. I caught on the swim bait hanging up there. But, nice. um, so, you know, people come from all over the world and they're like, how did you lose so much weight so fast? So I was yeah. like, bro, that ended like four years ago <laughs> <laughs> because the show airs all the time and it airs all over the world. We get clients coming from all over the world. So, it's kind of a cool thing, but yeah. So tattoo nightmares is, uh, is where most people in the public know me from. And then, um, I've been fishing since I was five years old, man. Like I've been a hardcore, hardcore fishing fan and hunter since I was five. And, uh, and, uh, uh my aunt's friend, he was a world war two veteran 
he was actually the one that took me fishing for the first time. And, and what's funny is my very first fish that I'm so addicted to now, obviously bass fishing, uh, was was a bass. And I was like a little bass, like this big. I caught on a worm, and it was like, yes, I'm addicted for the rest of my life, you know. Um, but yeah, so I'm a tattoo guy, and I love fishing, man. That's from here. I got to meet this guy at ICAST, and what <laughs> most people don't know is he was like surrounded by a million people, right? He's like, oh my God, Dave Burr, and he's doing this. And I just went right up in the middle of everyone. And I was like, dude, I have to say what's up to you, Dave. Like, I've been watching you my whole freaking life, like facts of fishing. And then I, I, I won't forget it. I told you, if you ever want a tattoo, I'll tattoo that ass off, man. And you just looked at me and you started laughing and stuff. <laughs> and you were like, I'll go to you if I need my ass tattooed off, is what you told me. I'll never forget that. It was so rad. So uh, rad, but I mean, if I ever get a tattoo, I promise you. Uh, I mean, I would like it to be you. Uh, yeah. Well, you and Jacob Wheeler. Jacob oh. Wheeler is a good friend of mine too, and he uh -huh. said, and I'm going to quote him on this on, on your show. Is he said, Gus, if I ever get a tattoo, I'm coming to you. So Jacob, I know you're watching or listening. You know? I still hold you up to that, bro. So yeah. Right. Maybe me and Wheeler will come do how how what a podcast that would make me and Wheeler <laughs> getting a tattoo like the three of us can just get together and we'll record it and it would be it would have uh, to say probably explicit at the <laughs> intro. <laughs> so if I read your bio, it, I mean, it says you grew up in L.A., you know, you started in street art, which is graffiti, basically, I would assume. Yeah. And then so where tell me your past and how. And like when, but when you say I fished since I was five years old, two of those things don't seem to match together. Well, it, it's funny because I mean, I grew up in the heart of LA, you know, downtown and, you know, we have riverbeds. And uh, so I grew up around a lot of like Chicano murals, um, you know, gangster art pretty much. And being around the neighborhood, grew up on straight gangster tattooing and, and low rider and that whole scene, you know, and uh, I was always you know, being raised with five brothers and a sister, we were always by ourselves. You know, my mom raised us by herself, my mom and my aunt. So, you know, the street, we were literally raised in the streets because my, both my aunt and my mother worked nonstop to try to feed all of us, you know? And so, um, that influential street mural, you know, gangs and which some people might see as a negative thing actually influenced me and, and to be creative. I mean, I was, graffiti when I was nine years old. I was, I was doing tattoos when I was 13 on in guys in the neighborhood, like just crazy stuff like that. And like my you first, your tattoo, first thir tattoo when you were 13, 13, actually not got it. You gave your first tattoo when you yeah, were 13. Yeah, so, so we were uh, at my friend Joey and Ricky's house and you know, we're hanging out. He's like, dude, I learned how to make a tattoo machine. And I was like, <laughs> and he's like, he's like, you got a tattoo me, man. Like, you're like a really good artist. And I'm like, Oh, I don't know about that, man. And so anyways, he made me the machine. I'm not gonna, you know, a couple drinks later at 13 years old. Hey, I grew up in the hood. We're drinking nasty Budweiser at the time. <laughs> and I go home and I'm like, I'm going to tattoo myself. So I went home, took the machine, tattooed myself. And I did this dumb gecko lizard on my knee that I still have till this day from a, a easy rider magazine it's like a biker magazine from back in the days yeah yeah and uh, and then i did my first tattoo at 13 years old it was a grim reaper with a graveyard and this scary halloween looking tree and that was it man and uh i i really enjoyed it and i loved it and at 15 i went to a tattoo shop with my friend's father and i saw this guy murdoch god rest his soul he, he passed away uh quite a few years back um i saw him tattooing in the chair and he's just big Hispanic guy, all tattooed, long hair. And I'm like, you know, you smell the old tattoo shops have a certain smell to them, bro, like green soap and it's all mucky. And there's like sailor and cholo flash everywhere. And I was like, that's what I want to be when I grow up. And at 15 years old, I mean, it struck me that that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. And don't get me wrong, like I had, you know, I had children at a very young age. So I had uh, my son at a very young age and I had abnormal jobs. And, and so, you know, working warehouse jobs, I didn't yeah. graduate, obviously, you know, coming from the street school and, and I have ADD and ADHD. And so I, I can't stay focused unless I'm like fishing or drawing and that's it. And so, uh, uh, you know, just your typical jobs that you have when you don't have a, 
high school education and tattooing is what is what uh, kept me focused. And finally, I got a really good job at a factory. And at 20 years old, I was offered a job at a tattoo studio and I couldn't keep up with both. And yeah. so I had to make a choice. You know what I mean? Either I slave labor or do I want to be who I want to be when I grow up? And so I chose who I want to be. And it was the best decision I ever made in my life, obviously. So so how do you go from being a 13-year-old kid tattooing a gecko on his knee with a homemade <laughs> tattoo device yeah. to being on one of the most popular tattoo shows ever? I, 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 I got to believe, you know, like, yeah, and it was right at that when the tattoo world was exploding totally. too, or, or from the outside, that's what it seemed like to me. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I have a very traditional background in tattooing. So, you know, I, ha- I was raised, I-, I didn't have an apprenticeship, but I was lucky. I was lucky enough to be around the right people like Jack Rudy, Tony Olivas, uh, Freddie Negretti, Rick Walters, uh, just, you know, Catfish Carl, these guys in Southern California that have been around forever and they saw my work. And they kind of like opened the doors to, there was a small group of us Chicano boys that we were doing a certain style of black and gray that no one's ever seen before. And so they opened the doors. And from that, we got the notoriety, you know, by the time I was uh, 28 years old, I had um, over 400 publications worldwide. I had over seven, 800 international and national awards for my work. Um, and I believe that all that hard work prior to the TV show is what got me asked to be on the show. And so, um, originally I was asked to do a show called Ink Masters and I was like, hell yeah, a hundred thousand dollars for doing graffiti, (laughs) tattooing, drawing on people. I was like, I'm in, I can do that all day, you know? And so, um, I, I actually got approved for that. They denied me. And then they said, we want to use you for another show. Like, we love your character. And I'm like, blah, 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 Hollywood talk. You know, I heard that. Or, so I let it go. And then, no, sure enough, as soon as Ink Masters was over, they were like, hey, Gus, we want to invite you back. We really want you on the show. And by that time, I had seen Ink Masters. Yeah. So I was like, hell no, I ain't going to be on no Ink Masters show. I'll smack the crap out of somebody the way they talk to artists. I'm like, uh-uh, I ain't doing that. I'm too old school. Someone's getting knocked out. My intro would be like, big Gus, LA, California and then edit it to a commercial. <laughs> it's just, I don't know, you know, some of those guys shouldn't pass judgment on traditional tattoo styles, whatever. That's just my personal opinion. But um, so, yeah, so I got on Tattoo Nightmares and uh, did the interview. You know, you do it just like what we're doing now, a Zoom yeah. thing. And then they're like, oh, my God. And then you go in for a live one and then you go in for your final. And then next, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this show just to have fun thinking it's only going to be one or two episodes. Yeah. And we ended up doing seven episodes our first season. <clears throat> and literally, I mean, I'm serious, Dave, overnight became a worldwide phenomenon. Like our show just yeah. took off. And then it, it, I never thought, you know, we, we filmed a total of 130 plus episodes and 89 of them were aired. So, I mean, and they're still aired till this day. So it's like, Yeah. Just some ghetto kid from L.A. who loves fishing and drawing. You know what I mean? So so does this getting that I mean, that breaks obviously huge for you in life and everything. But does because I also think of our two little industries where we come from, you know, from the fishing world, tattoo world. They're both kind of um, their closet industries, almost to speak. You know what I mean? Like so in some ways, subdivisions. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like, but, but they're they're like you can be a big deal in the fishing world and nobody knows who you are in the rest of the world and, and vice versa. Tattoo world. Exactly. Same, but the people that are into tattooing, they know. And the people that are into fishing, they know. So right. I look at those in similarities. But in some ways, did getting that gig make it tougher for you in the tattoo world? Because I could also see how there is, you know, there's that you sold out crap that everybody hears. Oh, when yeah. they, oh like the yeah. being sold out is the stupidest thing. Yeah. Anybody that's ever posted that on anybody you sold out, it means you got paid, which <laughs> is the goal to be honest. Yeah. I mean, I mean, actually, luckily for me, um, because the way our show was made, uh, 
the sellout thing wasn't so bad. Yeah. Most of the selling out was from the haters that wish they would have yeah. been in my position. You know what I mean? Exactly. Um, but I actually asked for my blessings from the old school guys before I did it. And really? uh, yeah, because it's like one of those things like, hey, man, like I'm a representation of an old generation. So it's like, I don't want to be disrespectful to that generation that I respect so much, even till this day. I mean, tattooing gave me everything. It gave me raising my family, my beautiful shop. I mean, traveling the world. So I have, I have a high respect for my industry. So I, I went to my elders and I asked like, Hey, what do you think about, about me doing this? And they were like, well, at least we'll have someone voicing and showing the opinion of true tattoo form and, yeah. and what we do. And so, um, Actually, it, it was actually the opposite from the really, uh, we'll just call them the well-known, respected artists. They actually watched the show with their families where they wouldn't even dare watch a tattoo show before. Oh, wow. Um, so it was a big deal to me. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it, there was a lot, a lot of pressure on me being on that show, you know, uh, being someone the face of, of, like I said, a traditional background of tattooing. And just representing a community, right? Like when you represent a community, that's a lot of, that's a lot of uh, uh, respect and power that you kind of have that you have to showcase it correctly, you know? So yeah, that was stressful. People didn't <laughs> see me losing my freaking mind behind the scenes though. It's like <laughs> breaking the cages because it was so hard to do that show, man. It was well, oh, What man. made it so hard? Like just getting your, getting it to be right and not what a producer wanted or... Yeah, we had the freedom on our show as far as the producing part goes, because like, like they chose us for who we were, right? And yeah. they chose us for the artwork that we're able to do. And so it, what made it difficult was the time constraint. You know, you're on television. So, you know, producing time, like scheduling and, and everything is on a time and on a budget. So, you know, you're waking up at 7 a.m. and you're tattooing all day. If I was tattooing that day on the show. And then you're working till 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Then you have to go back to the room, draw some more, and then wake up at seven o'clock and do it all over again. So you're yeah. having like these longer than 12 hour shifts, six days a week for seven months at a time. You don't see your family. You don't see nobody. You're, you're, I'm just stuck in some, some apartment they rent me. I mean, <laughs> it's nice that I get my coffee brought to me and my clothes is made like TV. I don't know how you do it. Cause they ruin you. Right. Like, they bring you yeah, everything that, you fish need. Fish and TV is not like that. Just so you, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> just so you know, they do not. They do not. They do yeah. not ruin you. Uh, they but ruin tell me, me how they ruined you. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, here you go, Gus. Here's your breakfast and your clothes, and you're just like, man, this is. I need to get used to this stuff, you know. So, but anyway, it, so the 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 stress of trying to perform. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, I'm still a tattoo artist, and I'm known for who I am, and so my work is what's going to make me uh, be able to take care of my family the rest of my life. I can't just put that on the back burner just because I'm doing a show. Those clients mean more to me than that show. My tattoo work means more to me than the television show. And every client I tattooed, regardless if it was going to be on TV or not, I had to make sure that tattoo was 1000% what I expect it to be out of me. You know what I mean? So um, I'm very picky when it comes to cover-ups and, and, or just tattooing in general. So I care about the clients. I care about what they do, the experience. It's not just about the tattoo either. Like I like people to come to my shop and have a good time and feel like they've known me for 10 years. It's the whole thing means a lot to me. So the TV thing, I kind of just put on the back burner. So sometimes the conversations would get a little out of hand and they'd be like, take five guts. We can't say that on television. <laughs> <laughs> I said a lot of stuff you can't say on television, but uh, you know. <laughs> That, that happens. That happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's get back into fishing then. How does this, you, you're growing up learning to tattoo and where were, where was fishing for you? Like, but where did you go growing up? Uh, that's funny. I'd go to the LA riverbed with freaking cardboard boxes and cans Hot spot. floating down the river spots, man. You know, like we fish for, We'd fish for carp and catfish. It was in the LA Riverbed. Believe, believe it or not, there was some good fishing in the LA Riverbed. It was a little bit dirtier back when we were kids. I mean, uh, it's not as clean. It's it's a lot cleaner now than it was back then. I mean, we were literally like, I mean, you saw everything in the LA Riverbed growing up as a kid fishing it, you know? So, and then parks, obviously, you know, we'd go fish parks and 
places like that. And, uh, and then as I got older, you know, tattooing, I had a better job. I had a car to go around Yeah, and really got heavily into trout fishing. And so I started going to the Sierras and I started, I became what we call a trout bum and, you know, learned a lot about finesse fishing from trout fishing. Yeah. Um, still fish for bass, but I was like super hardcore into trout fishing for a while. And then as my tattoo got better, the more money I made, I started going different places. I started traveling the world. I would always take a rod with me, man, you know, or I would meet people that were fishing or, and they would take me fishing. Uh, it's just until recently that I just showcased to the world that I love fishing. So they're yeah. like, Oh my God, you love fishing. I didn't know you were that hardcore. And I'm like, well, I've been, you know, I've been hardcore since I was a kid, but just like any kid who grows up poor and is a hustler, like I need to find avenues on like, okay, I'm starting to realize bass fishing is really expensive. <laughs> like, and I have a lot of kids. How can I make this work? And, and boom, the light, light bulb went off and that hustle mentality went off. And it's like, okay, well, let me use my fame. Um, uh, I love fishing and combine both and um, started working on <clears throat> corporate sponsors and whatnot. And Okuma and uh, Okuma Fishing uh, Tackle was the first ones to pick me up. And I've been with them for quite a while now, about 10 years or so. And it's just taken off since then. You know what I mean? Now I'm working with Sims and, and Okuma and all these awesome brands, Fish Lab Tackle, and just, just great companies to support what I do. And it's, it, now it's just all for content, though, right? Like, uh, yeah. uh, people are like, you're a natural being on, <laughs> on camera. Gus, like, you're so natural. And like, so I said, oh, my wife actually brought up the idea, like, you should make YouTube videos for fishing. And I was like, man, no one wants to watch me fishing. No way. And she's like, I'm telling you, people just love you for who you are, honey. And I was like, all right, screw it. Ah, here we are. They kind of help with the content thing, though, because, you know, companies nowadays and brands, they want to work with content creators that can promote, you know, their products in a good way. So, yeah, that's what I do now. So I got a YouTube channel now and everything on fishing. So it's kind of cool. So did you at one time not really talk about fishing purposely? I, I yeah. would think, yeah, in the oh, yeah. tattoo world, it'd be like, yeah, no, I, I don't no. know. Because yeah. of the, again, just like people look at the tattoo world and they probably have a preconceived notion that isn't real. You know what I mean? Right. Like they make it into something just like the fishing world. I mean, everybody thinks, oh, if you're into fishing, then, oh, you must wear a lot of khaki. Flannels. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's <laughs> it's obviously not the same for everybody. But so you you didn't talk about it purposely because of what you the world you were in, basically. Well, kind of. Yes and no. One one main reason why I didn't do it is because, I mean, at the time, fishing wasn't cool. Right. Like it's like yeah. people thought like fishing is like so boring and lame. And you're just like, well, it's like you really can't have a conversation with somebody who doesn't fish because they don't understand it. The <laughs> mentality that you have to like that you're driven to catch these little animals swimming in water. But, um, and then the second thing is, is, you know, once I became a celebrity is what they call it is I didn't want, I didn't want those things like interfering with my time off from, from that world, you know, uh, as social butterfly as I am, believe it or not, the, the TV show made me kind of introvert. Like yeah. it made me go like, Whoa, like what in the heck is going on? Cause I was getting so much attention and it got to the point where me and my wife would only go out on our dates to like movie theaters at 12 o'clock at night. Cause it's like everywhere I went, um, it was crazy. I mean, I mean to the point where it got me, at, I, I got a quick funny story. I'm going to the airport. I just got, I'm coming back from Miami, did a tattoo convention, got my bags packed, get on the plane. And I land in Dallas and these two federal drug agents meet me at the gate. And I was like, this Trialba, come with us. And I was like, okay, what is this about? And they're like, they're like drug enforcement, you know, do, do you have large amounts of cash in your bags? I said, well, I mean, yeah, I got like 10 grand. I just finished tattooing all weekend. And they're like, what? And then, so as we're walking there, I guess they were going to take me to this room where they like interview you for like drug dealing or something. But as I was walking, everybody in the airport was like, oh, my God, big Gus, can we take pictures? The kids were freaking out. And so then the federal agents were like, are you famous? And I was like, uh, uh, I'm a pretty well-known tattoo artist. I got a TV show. 
and by the time we didn't even make it to the room, they're like, all right, have a good day. <laughs> like they just let me go. But I was like, what in the heck was that all about? You know, I was like about to be questioned for drug dealing from Miami almost. And my mind, I'm like, there's no live fish in my bag or <laughs> <laughs> It, it either goes one of two ways, I've found. You know, like every time I get pulled over, I'm like, well, we're going to find out this cop is either a fishing fan or he doesn't <laughs> care about my fancy little boat and the oh, rush God, that I'm yeah. in to get to the body of water. Oh, man. I've been so lucky on that situation too, brother. <laughs> mm -mm. So... But you've done so much more than just... Like, you make it seem like, oh, I just do a YouTube channel. You started... Uh, a very successful um, Instagram page. Uh, yeah. It, tell me about that. Like, but where did all of that come together? And then the coolest thing that really, that really ties us both in together is we both do a lot of work for autism and this being yeah. the perfect month. That's why I wanted to have yeah, you yeah, on yeah. here. But, but, but how did all of this, because I didn't even really understand the pieces. Like, I, to be honest, I mean, we met each other at a show. I thought you were a good dude. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, I, really, like outside of just, hey, man, he's wacky and he made me laugh. And I, you know what I mean? You were a similar person to me. Like, right, I'm right, like, that's right, another right. idiot that made a living being an idiot. Um, so thank God. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> I say that every day. Um, but but outside of that, I, I don't know how any of this all connects together. I know that you do a bunch of different stuff. So so what was the first foray into fishing and how did we get to where we are here today? As far as like all the not just loving the sport and loving fishing, but swim bait culture and all of yeah. this stuff that you're doing. I, I think uh, you're actually I saw that you were an advocate for autism, actually. Um, and, you know, watching your podcast and seeing all the people you work with, like Brandon Polinick and stuff. And, and I was like, I was like, Oh, well, we do an autism thing. I want to shoot that out to Dave and see what he thinks, you know? And we started swim bay culture originally as a platform that we wanted it to be a big bait community, right? There's a yeah. couple, um, swim bait universe, I'm, you know, big family on that. That's like a big Facebook group. Uh, and then you have other platforms that are big bait communities, but I noticed that a lot of the platforms like on Instagram and whatnot were very like, like, uh, driven towards like certain things, like very specific. And so swim bait culture, I wanted it to be more of like, a, a first time community thing where like, Hey, we don't care if you caught a, a one pounder on a big bait or if you caught a 10 pounder, we don't care if you have 3 million followers or if you have two followers, everyone, I wanted them to feel equal on swim bait cultures, uh, social media platforms. And, and uh, I'm a big firm believer in community, uh, like working together uh, with communities, right? Like the, I feel like you're stronger when you work with others instead of working against them, even though Always, you have yeah. similar things, right? Like even though you have similar platforms, similar agendas, I feel like if you work, like I work closely with a group with swim Bay universe, for example, and when you work very closely with these larger groups and you make it a true community, you grow faster. Right. Yeah. And, and you're able to uh, showcase true community built first social media platforms is what I call it. And so it grew faster than I could imagine. I mean, luckily for me, um, I have a lot of friends in the big bait community and I'm talking about like big bait guys, you know, that are very well known. I mean, everyone from Piz to, uh, Rafa swim baits to fin bait. Cause I mean, there's, it's endless the amount of people that I have friendships with. And so they were able to help me get it started. I didn't want people to know um, that I owned it though. I really wanted swim bait culture to grow organically Yeah. Um, because you know how it is, man. Like you, you want things to grow cause you want them to have a natural growth rate to them. You don't want them to be fall just because someone, Oh, Gus is a tattoo artist. Well, I don't want you to follow me for that reason. I want you to follow me because of what this platform is for. Yeah. And so it took a while until I did my, my first podcast uh, on uh, Cast and Crank. It's a local podcast here in our area, and my friend Nick does it. And that's finally when people realized I was the owner of Swim Bay Culture. And so then it really started taking off. And, and, and I started thinking to myself, well, I've been raising – uh, 
autism awareness for the last 19 years in my tattoo community and so forth. And I've raised tons of money, worked with many foundations. And I, I just had a wild thought one day to be like, hey, these, these guys, I mean, the swim bait community is insane, bro. Like, like these guys are oh, like, yeah. like, that's why it's called swim bait culture. Cause it's literally yeah. a cult. And I think very <laughs> similar to the tattoo world. Like, I think that right. if there's a tie in very like similar, those, they, they, those guys, there's a lot of people from that community that don't identify with a lot of other oh. fishing. I mean, they're totally. the group that has taken, I don't want to catch 10 fish. I don't want to catch five fish. I want to catch giant one. Like, you know right. what I mean? Like, I love that. Right. And there's an edge to it. So I could see how that'd be a, an obvious tie. And, and the and fact that you're art, from artist, the uh, West Coast, too. I right, mean. right. Well, I mean, it is. it was born and raised on the West Coast, yeah. technically speaking. Um, but it's like, it's also art, right? I mean, yeah. when you look at these swim baits, they're beautiful, man. They're like, they're, they're made well. They're handmade, just like art is. Um, I think the nostalgic of that also is what draws people into the swim bait culture, you know, like the community. It's like, wow, you got these amazing baits that are made by hand and they catch giant fish. Yeah. And so um, anyways, um, the big bait game for me is something I didn't really, I wasn't a professional at it. Right. It's just, I was, I've been fishing my whole life. I've been, I've been field testing for Okuma, field testing for, Savage gear at the time when it was with Okuma, I did, I was, I had a lot to do with like the first glide baits and all that. My friend Mike invited me on and we would do trips with, you know, fishing for massive stripers on swim baits and bass and all this stuff. And that's actually what reintro reintroduced me into the big bait world uh, because I wasn't always like strictly, you know, swim baits. Like, no, like I'm a fisherman and I fish for everything, trout, yeah. tarpon, marlin, you name it. And um, I went to a show called Toxic Day, and Caesar was having this one uh, show that he has out there called Toxic Day, where these swim baits guys get together. And he says, "You know, we're not just a bunch of swim baiters; we're a swim bait culture." Ding! I I shit you not, dude. I like got on my phone, being a business owner and knowing how <laughs> things work. I was like, da -da 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 -da. "Oh, nobody owns these names." Boom, bought the LLC, bought the name, bought the website, bought everything, go with it. And, and so that was like the birth of the big bait community growing into what it is now for swim bait culture. Um, and so now I'm working with bigger foundations. And now with you with autism, I was like, back to what I was talking about. Like I said, I have ADD and ADHD, guys. So sorry if I go into a million places. <laughs> If they but listen back to, to the this question podcast, you asked me is how they're used to that. <laughs> yeah. They're like, what are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um so back to the autism thing when i saw your podcast and being an advocate i was like i gotta hit dave up and let him know what we're doing and you were like oh man that's like that'd be perfect for the autism month and so here we are uh, on your show and i'm like beyond stoked like people don't even realize how stoked i am to be on the show right now like you guys don't even threat <laughs> it's i'm sorry dave like i'm fangirling over here with you brother i'm like no way I got Dave Mercer podcast going on. <laughs> it, it, it'll be a big letdown. I'm so don't get excited. It, you know, uh, I've been told that many times, not in a good way either. <laughs> about me? That I'm a big letdown? No, about probably me. Probably talking to my family. Late at night. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Buddy makes bitch and tattoos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what? what is... Swim baits for autism. How does that work? So uh, once we established our platform, Swim Bait Culture, and it, we got the growth and the, you know, the, 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 the traffic we get on that site in our, in our social media is insane. I mean, it's, I can't believe it. So the idea clicked in my head, hey, you got all these guys that make beautiful baits you promote them on your page. Why don't we just like, I did an art show to raise money for autism. I was like, why don't we do a swim bait, you know, swim bait, like a uh, event where we get these um, swim bait makers to donate their baits and we raffle them off. And I have the, I have everything to do it. I have websites. I have people that help me with social media. So I can do everything legit. Right. Cause when it comes to fundraising, you got to keep track of everything and blah, 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 blah. And so I was like, all the things kind of went, da, 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 da. and I was like, let's do it. And I hit up a couple of main guys, 
like pits and reckless rodents and uh, toxic baits and um, UFO baits and just these guys that people follow hard yeah. for. Um, Bullshad swim baits. We all know Mike, you know, yeah. he was one of my first supporters. Um, and uh, they all said, yeah, like with, without even questioning it. And so got a bunch of guys. And we did our first event and it did really well. We raised about like, I think our first event, our first year, which was three years ago, we did about like a little over five grand. And to me, I was like, whoa, that's freaking pretty cool. I've never done it before. That was rad. Let's tell. All right. And then the response is what made me want to do it again. Cause you know, me and my wife do it by ourselves. Wow. We, we do all the, I do all the social media part, all the photography, all the videos, I do all the, uh, the promoting, I do all the Photoshop, everything mm -hmm. that has to do with that aspect of it. I do it myself. And then my wife is in charge of keeping track of the sales, um, uh, the tickets, you know, writing everyone's names and phone numbers yeah. on the tickets. Cause that's how we all the important everyone. stuff. The very important stuff. Just actually. like my house. <laughs> yeah. You know, the wife's the one that's in charge of the good stuff, you know? What yeah. I mean? Yeah. And so, so, uh, as much work as it, it was like, because of the response, I never realized uh, in the swim bait community, or let's just say in the fishing community, how many people are affected by autism. But once you like, once you plant that seed, so to speak, it like blossoms fast and you yeah. start to get like all this beautiful water that's being fed to this beautiful flower. And you're just like, wow. And then next, you know, it's a, big beautiful rose bush you know what i mean and so that's kind of like how swim baits for autism is it's uh it started off as a little seed a little idea and with the right people helped me grow it and now um it affects not only families but guys that make the swim baits you know guys that paint the swim baits people in the community i mean uh, we do we do unique t-shirts like this one every year that that are designed by a certain or not designed but they're inspired by a certain bait. So yeah. I, I pick a certain bait to go with the theme for the year. So the first year was toxic baits, um, his swim bait. The second year was Piz, and this year it's from Cody's gill. Um, but it's, it's my way of like, like, uh, connecting with the audience, yeah. right? It's like, Hey, I know these baits are popular. I know these people love these baits. And so I like to connect the love for people that they have for those baits with my artwork and it works out it works out wonderful, man. And then add, you know, the bait collections that we get, like this year is our biggest um, event ever. We got over a hundred lots. So the lots are pretty much swim baits in groups and each lot is a prize. Um, and we got over a hundred lots and we got like custom swim bait rod by Leviathan. That's like, it's all, it's beautiful, man. It's like all handmade. It's got you know, puzzle color pieces in it. And you're talking about $700 custom rod from Leviathan, custom rod from F5 Customs. Uh, we got St. Croix involved this year, Sims. We got uh, um, Jenko Fishing. Like these companies that just reached out to us and just like, we got like 10 rods to go with swim baits that are like $800 swim baits out here. Like it's crazy, <laughs> dude. So is you it know? an auction or is it a, a raffle? No, it's, it's a raffle, right? So, I mean, in social media world, you can't say raffle because they don't like the term raffle. Uh, um, so okay. we say, a, we say event. Uh, uh -huh. So it's an event. So yeah, pretty much it's a raffle, dude. And so you buy tickets through our website and everyone's name and phone numbers put on the ticket and it's put into a Tumblr. And I, I'm very, like I said, I'm a social dude. So I love the interaction with the community. And I thought like, you know, I see a lot of people doing like these computer generator things where they just push yeah. a button and click. I'm like, that is so damn boring. I ain't doing that. So I was like, I, again, light bulb went off and I'm like, I'm going to do it live. I'm going to pick the people live so that people could see that we're being very fair. They can see the Tumblr and I get to interact with people. And, you know, it's, it's, and, and I think people enjoy me being interacting with them on the, on the events more than anything. Cause you're talking to people and you're like, yeah. you know, you're laughing with people and people are letting you know, Hey, my daughter's autistic. And I'm like, Oh, you know, and you're just, there's something about being personal when it comes to doing things like this, that makes it that much more sweeter, you know, instead of just having some computer generated, you know, having someone live that you can watch on a video, like, you know, what we're doing now, it's, 
it takes it to a whole nother level. You know, it's kind of like you're there. And you know? now I've actually, it's grown so big that I want to actually make it an event where we like get a hall next year or something. Cause it's like, it's grown crazy big. And I would love to like make it a thing where we have some of these companies come out and we have things for kids and stuff yeah. like that, you know? And it's, yeah, like that's where I'm thinking about going with it right now. Cause it's just like, wow. So is there still time to buy tickets right now, like in the next week or does it go to the end of the month or, or is it done? It goes to the end of the month. So I don't know when you're going to air this, but our sales end on the 29th, which is this Friday. You will have two um, days. Act fast, ladies and gentlemen. This goes <laughs> live on the 27th. Buy tickets oh. before the 29th. Yes. Okay. I'll so put got- all the links and everything down below. Awesome. Look at me sounding like a YouTuber. No big deal. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean. Like I said, you, you buy the tickets through our website. Everything is, is legit. There's no like PayPal me this. No, everything is like a bot purchase. You get the tickets. You get an email sent to you with your tickets, uh, a copy of your tickets, and it'll have your name and phone number on there. And we pick everyone by name and phone number. So don't worry about the numbers and stuff like that. So, yeah, you got two days, guys. You got over 100 lots. You got like eight rod companies. Our first place, our main prize has a Leviathan rod, a, Sw- a Sims CX full suit and gear um, and multiple baits worth over like 2,500 bucks. Wow. So it, I mean, it's, it's pretty rad. If you're, if you're a hardcore swim bait enthusiast, like there's no better deal, man, for 20 bucks, you can win that much cool stuff. And some of the baits you, are impossible to get. You know how it so, is in the swim bait, swim bait community. So it's $20 a ticket. Is that how much tickets are? Yeah. They're only 20 bucks a ticket or they're five for 80 bucks. Most wow. people buy the five for 80 bucks. Cause I would, I mean, I, if, there's, yeah, there's a lot of chances for you to win. I mean, last year's prize winner won with one ticket. <laughs> he it's bought one ticket. <laughs> <laughs> well, we shouldn't tell them that when we're trying to convince them to buy the five pack, Gus. Whatever. Just every a little, little tip. <laughs> every little bit helps, but, you know, yeah. do the 80. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everybody who's watching this, please support this because I think it's a great, a great cause. And, um, and it's from the heart. And I think that's the coolest Thank thing. You. I think that's one of the things that you're, that's what I'm hearing when you're explaining it. And, and because I've felt it from, from the fishing community myself, um, it's, they're all, they're not just, you know, companies donate stuff all the time, but this right. is, it, you're having companies Personal. reach out to you and companies yeah. that, you know, want to make this bigger. I mean, the, you, you talked about uh, the bullshed, you know, I, I, Buka and uh, is it Jennifer, his painter? They just like yeah, dropped Jen. this one off to me, and they're like, "We need you to do something with it." So we're gonna figure yeah. out something to do with that. Yeah, um, we had one like that last year, so they're amazing, man. You know, like it, it. People really get personal with this event with us. Like they, they're so emotionally attached to swim baits for autism, and uh, it, it makes me feel really good. Because I mean, like I like I said, I've been working with foundations and charities for the last 19 years. And recently, as we were talking earlier, my daughter Cleo has just been, we've just been told is autistic. And so, you know, now not only being around children with autism, now I'm a father to one of my children who is autistic. So now it's like, Whoa, okay. Now it's like, I don't know, Dave, like I told you, man, it's like God was preparing me for 19 years so that I can raise this beautiful little girl. And so now it's like, uh, it makes me want to cheer up sometimes, man. Cause you know, it's yeah. tough, like finding that stuff out as a father. And, uh, you know, you, as a father, you, you love them and you want them to, to grow up and be able to take care of themselves. And, and, you know, these children are programmed differently. So that, that thought of like, Oh my God, I'm not going to be here forever. And you know, your child has that, that, you know, that, different programming mindset that it's, 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 it worries you. Right. I mean, as a parent, like you just want them to be safe and love them. And yeah. So those are things that I'm trying to accept right now and, uh, and get her the right programming and education and therapy. Uh, but that's also a difficult process process that we have to go through too. It's all, it's new to me, even though I've been doing this for a long time now, actually having to search out the resources for, the autism schooling and therapies it's it's not as easy as i thought it was but um luckily for us in california we have uh good programs um for autism here and uh 
but first we have to finish her um, evaluation. So, you know, children with autism have to be evaluated. And uh, like we were talking about earlier, I don't believe that they should be put on a spectrum, but you never know high functioning or low functioning. But in order for us to get the therapies and the, and the yeah. education that we need, she has to be evaluated. Unfortunately for us, though, it's like a lot of our, our good uh, evaluation autism centers don't take our insurance at the moment. So now I'm in a predicament where like, okay, time to sell some baits because my daughter needs to be evaluated, you know? And uh, people are like, oh, why don't you use the money that you're raising from autism? It's like, because those are for the foundations that I've stuck to yeah. my whole life. And so I can always find other means to help my own child. You know what I mean? So yeah. my focus is working with autism awareness organization for autism. Um, I also work with blind children school foundation, which is a local school here in, in, uh, in town that they help blind autistic children and blind children. Uh, so to me that matters most. Right. And so yeah. making sure that we, get the money to where I wanted to go. And if you guys want to know, by the way, since we're on it, if you want to know who we work with as far as foundations, you can always go on our social media platforms and just scroll to our past events and you'll see everything that we've done and what organizations we work with and continue to work with for this foundation, for this event. So um, yeah, man, I'm a, I, I've been an advocate and now being a father yeah. to a child with autism, I'm like, oh, it's like so, so near and dear. Like, my friend made me a, I made a video recently of a, my friend Eric made me a custom rod from Leviathan. And it was all like autistic and it had my artwork on it and it had my daughter's name on it. And like, I was like all sensitive and just like pouring tears, man, you know, cause it just hits me like that. So, and it hit me like that before. And now it's like, hits me like that even more. So yeah. I'm all about raising awareness for autism and having people understand it. Um, you know, Maybe you'll think twice next time you see a child freaking out at a restaurant yeah. and, and you realize, hey, that child's not having a tantrum. You can tell that that child has uh, autism or some form of autism because we've raised awareness enough that that person went and looked up what autism is, kind of started researching it, which is what it's all about, right? It's like you want to plant that seed in people's minds, just get the word autism in their mind, and then they want to be curious and see what that's about. And then they learn a lot just from yeah. that curiosity. And yeah. so, you know, that's the best thing about platforms like uh, mine and yours and, and uh, John Cruz and Brandon and all these guys that are doing stuff like that is, is all these people are planting those seeds to help educate people so that they don't stare at these children or, you know, all the things that as a dad, like that you go through emotionally when you're out in public, you know, cause you know, you like be twice about, going to the restaurant, you know, think twice about going to the amusement park because you have to prepare yourself. Okay. My, are they going to have these sensory outbursts and, yeah, you know, and it's just those things that natural humans are going to do is they're going to stare and trying to keep yourself calm. And I've heard the thousands and thousands of stories of, from parents of, you know, dads wanting to beat people up all day because they have to, you know, tell them like, no, she's autistic. Stop staring at her. Like, but Hopefully through through these uh, social media things that we're doing, we're able to, again, educate people, at least plant the seed, the word autism in their mind so that they can go and, and learn about themselves, what it's all about. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it's, um, it, it, you know, you've, you've preached community through all of this. And really, that's the thing about autism that, that I think really brings it home because it is like, there's a reason that the logo is a puzzle piece because it's puzzle right. pieces. Like if you get certain things, there's a way to deal them with, with them. But in autism, it, it just because something worked for my daughter, doesn't mean it'll work for your right. daughter. And just because it worked for them, doesn't mean it'll work for every kid is different. And there's so many things that are triggering these kids that, that, right. And it's the best time for them, really, to be honest, when you think about it, because years ago, nobody knew. But like, I mean, simple things like fluorescent lighting, you know, like for most autistic people, that is literally like walking in a room with a strobe light. Now, put yourself in that position. Just think right. of of what it would be like to do this podcast, to to have a conversation, to work out a math problem while a strobe light is going off. And while right. that's happening, you're also picking up on every single little noise. And it, and sound and visual yeah. aspect. But that's definitely. also what makes autistic kids so amazing. You know what I mean? Very there's, true. There's, Very true. there's people that have accomplished 
so, so much in this world. And it's because they're autistic, because they can also focus. Um, I mean, my daughter is a great artist. And the, and the reason that she is as good at it as she is, is because she can focus on that. Like nothing else in the world yeah. matters if she's focused yeah. on that right yeah. in front of her. And, and um, you see a lot of people like that, yeah. you know, and they got to figure out how to get through the world because when you have that hyper focus, you don't care about anything else. So the whole rest of the world could be falling down around you. But it's, um, but it's genius though. Right. If you think about oh, how yeah. genius that is, right. It's like to, to have, especially in this day and age where we're so interactive with so many distractions, phones and whatnot and, and platforms. It's like, it's, it's, it's genius how these kids can like cancel all that out and be like amazing pianists or mathematical or engineers or, or artists that draw musicians. I mean, we can go on and on um, the celebrities and, and, and traits of people that have autism that have become successful and done things for our world. Yeah. You know, because they were that focused on what they wanted to do. And um, it, it's interesting um, that, their minds can be so distracted yet so focused at the same time. Again, going back to what you just said about the puzzle thing. And so, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see where my daughter goes, you know, yeah. um, luckily for me, I'm, I'm blessed that um, she does say few words. She, she, she can say some stuff, um, not really well, but she, you know, I just had a client that I tattooed from Washington who's, tattooed a, a, a silhouette of him holding his son up and it's the universe and the puzzle pieces are like turning into the universe. Oh and, wow! And he was like, he was so emotionally connected to this tattoo because his son had just said the word dad for the first time and he's nine years old. Wow. And so that's a heavy thing to hear those things. You know what I mean? So um, not saying that, I'm blessed that my daughter can say dad, but I feel grateful and, and thankful that she can say dad or, or she can say mom. And um, I'm excited to see if she develops into an artist or a musicianist or something. Or If not, that's okay too. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's, she's going to be who she's going to be. God made her the way she is because that's the way he wanted her. So yeah. I'm just here to help, help guide her and make sure she's not around boys. <laughs> Well, and she's got the best thing going for her, really. Like, that is the first thing. You need parents that care. You need parents yeah. that are going to advocate for you and work with you. Yeah. And you need to, as you get older, you need to become your own advocate or, or build it around. You know what I mean? It's it's definitely. And and when people say, um, I've had a few people sometimes say, well, what what is autism awareness? Because some people would like to, th but what it is, is it's just talking about it. It's just people being aware that, like you said, somebody that is throwing what you think is a temper tantrum probably has a lot more going on. Uh, right. It, right. it, um, and, and there's all different sides of it. And it's, it's, um, it's amazing how the fishing community has come together from all different areas. So yeah, support everything that this guy is doing. And I yeah, will, yeah, yeah. I'm thankful to every single, I'm thankful to every single bait maker that makes it possible. I mean, if it wasn't for all these companies and stuff like, yeah, we have bigger companies, but the guys that like make these baits by hand and create these beautiful pieces of artwork, um, I'm very grateful for them for donating their time, their effort, and, and emotionally putting their heart into these things so that um, people can enjoy them and so that we're able to spread autism awareness. You know, I mean, I, I couldn't, we couldn't do it without them. So no. we're, we're lucky that Swim Bay Culture has grown to that platform where we're able to promote it to a large audience. I mean, here I am talking with the voice of Bassmasters. Is, is that what I've known? <laughs> I'm just so awkward and weird. So I, I did one uh, thing really she bad said. at it. Is, is, yes. <laughs> Story no, man, I'm of just, my life. I, I'm just saying, like, you know, it's gotten us to this point where we're yeah. able to have great people like yourselves and, you know, uh, other platforms that we can work with and other uh, companies so that we're able to grow this to an even bigger thing than we have. And so hopefully with this podcast, people, if they ever want to work with us for next year stuff, man, reach out to me. We look, we, we take it all. The, the swim bay community is like I said, they're awesome. They're crazy, but they're awesome. They're hardcore. They've embraced the autism awareness. Um, 
before we started autism awareness, there really wasn't like uh, 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 something that people were like really grasping to as far as like, uh, you know, some type of fundraiser and, and uh, Swimmates for Autism has created that amongst uh, many platforms, you know, yeah. Swimmate Culture and, and all these other Swimmate Universe and yourself and all these people from different aspects of fishing are now being brought together because of this one thing I started. And that's honestly what I wanted. Like, yeah. I, I just want to work with people to grow it. And, and it's, it's just a beautiful thing, man. Like I said, it's a, it's a little seed that turned into a flower that's now blossomed into a beautiful rose bush. So wow. I'm stoked, bro. I'm stoked to see where this goes and, and, you know, grow it bigger and bigger and, and be an advocate, not only for children with autism, but also for my daughter now. So yeah, yeah. families like yourself, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's rad. It, it's it's incredible and and it's what makes it the most powerful is it's just everybody's genuine and it, the community has really embraced yeah. it so so thank you to uh, and me and Cruz were talking about this last week you know we want everybody to do it like the more people that do something like if you do something for autism whether it be well, what you're doing what you know there's so many different things cropping up like you see all these yeah. different things you're like this is great like but yeah you know i saw the stuff that you guys were doing at swim bait culture before i even knew it was connected to you you know what i mean oh, right so on. it's cool to see how all of that is coming together um so i mean maybe that 13 year old kid with the homemade a tattoo machine. It worked out all right for you. Some people say yeah. they, they fish. So like a lot of pro anglers say that they fish just so they can afford to hunt. Do, do you tattoo just so you can afford to fish or <laughs> where do these things rank in your life? That is 1 million percent true. I mean, I definitely fish because of tattooing. I mean, tattooing gives me the luxury of being able to have my own time schedule and being my own boss, owning my own shop. Um, traveling and whatnot. It's uh, most definitely my first love of, is obviously art and tattooing and painting and stuff. And that has given me the opportunity to have more freedom to not only be with my family, but to go fishing. And, uh, and, and I love it, man. You know, the, the, the uh, career that I've built through my tattooing has um, enabled me to do so many fun things in fishing and, and grow my love for fishing to the point now where fishing is becoming almost like another avenue of income now because of it. And that's kind of cool too. Not that I want it to become that, but Hey man, I'm a, a, again, I'm a poor kid from LA and anytime I can resource myself to make money, to take care of my family and through my art, because swim bait culture is my company and everything I sell through swim bait culture is my artwork on gear and t-shirts. And sometimes we do bait collaborations and, I'm actually been working on my own stuff for the last couple of years now that I'll be releasing soon um, that only few people know, but now everyone's going to know, but so oh, it's, it's just an exclusive. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to, well, me and my friend have been working on some stuff that we'll be releasing in the near future, but I'm so picky that I'm just like, I don't even show people what it is yet. So um, I, I just, you know, it, it gives me the avenue to take care of my family because of all that. And, and I appreciate everyone that supports me and supports my art because first and foremost, they support my art and who I am as a person. And that means the world to me. Cause again, man, like when you grow up, when you grow up poor and you grow up in LA and, and you know, you're living on welfare cheese, beans and all that stuff. And, and then you grow up into this world where if you would have told me when I was 15, that I would be a world famous uh, tattoo artist and I would travel the world and go tattoo and draw on people and fish. I tell you, you're smoking dope. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I feel very blessed to be put in the opportunity that I am, but with those opportunities, um, you know, there, there comes a lot of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like you got to have a lot of respect for once you put in that position because everything you voice your opinion on matters to so many people. So you got to be careful. Like you can't just get on, on social media and be like, F that and do this. Like, no, you gotta, you gotta remember that a lot of people follow you and what you do and you got to do it all in a positive way. And so swim bait culture, everything we do on swim bait culture is positive. Whether, and that goes from community driven. Like I said, your first baits that you're making, or if you're somebody that's already established, 
or if you're just a community that wants some uh, some guidance or or if you need help with your fundraiser, hey, that's what I'm here for. And I've done it already. I've helped many people with their fundraisers. I've helped people with growing their companies. I've helped people with building their other social sites. Like that's what it's all about. I'm here to help people. And because of my success in tattooing, because of my success in television, and also in fishing now, um, I use that success to help kids. Yeah. Um, and my life goal is to uh, take all that success that I've had and pay it forward um, with helping children. And, and that can go in any way. Like I said, I help blind children, autistic children. I mean, when I go to, when I go to events for uh, Swim Bay Culture or my, my YouTube and my other companies called Fishily, and when I go do those events too, I give out more clothes and hats to kids and I do sell it. So it's like, yeah. to me, it's just about getting these kids stoked on fishing and, and, and having them be excited, you know, like to meet people that uh, encourage them to go fishing and, and just pass on that passion. Cause I'm, I'm very passionate about fishing as much as I am tattooing and they and I love them both dearly. So I'm able to use that and pay it forward to the kids, you know, yeah. being a dad my whole life. I've been a dad my whole life, man. So like, I have a big heart for kids, you know, I'm a sucker. I'll be like, here, take everything I have if you want it, you know, when it comes to kids. So that's, that's just the way I am, man. I can't help it. You said something at the very beginning that, that really hit with me because I, I feel like, I, I think that's the true happiness and success you, you reach in life is when you, I think everybody's got a thing and some people have multiple things, but there's a place or a thing that you do that grounds you. And you said it, early in this chat, you said uh, it's always been fishing or art that has stopped the noise, like allowed. Yeah. It, is it still that today? Like, it, Most the, I, I feel like that for me. I mean, there's two spots when I'm focused on fishing or when I'm focused on, you know, being on stage entertaining. That's when everything else i'm a spaz like you it's just a million things going on at one time but yeah but I feel yeah like those things for me they're the white noise that allows it all to just like when the boat floats off the trailer bunks all of a <laughs> sudden i'm like oh like yeah. so much so that my wife will like routinely be like you need to fish you're being a jackass like <laughs> go fish <laughs> that's so funny you say that dude my wife I'll get in those moods where like, you know how it is. I got a million jobs, right? I mean, I own, I own two companies and I own a tattoo shop. I do content for fishing. Like I, yeah. I do logos for companies. I'm like all over the place when it comes to work. So my wife is like, she'll just look at me one day. She'll like, you know what? You just need to take your butt to the lake. And I'm just like, okay then. <laughs> but well, yeah, fine, I mean, then. that's how it is for me. It's like, um, I have, you know, my brain being our, artistic creatively driven all my whole life like my brain never stops like my brain is always like speaking of ideas wanting to be co creative concepts like, yeah. blah, 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 blah. like my brain does this right like constantly the only thing that gets it to go what is tattooing and fishing and like like literally nothing else is there you know i have no i have no radio when i'm fishing I have no, no, all I hear is birds chirping, the water moving, the sun rising, the trees blowing in the wind, like no noise at all. Like I just, it's just me and whatever's in the water, whether it's trout, bass, tarpon, marlin, it doesn't matter. I'm just focused on fishing. And when I'm tattooing, I'm just focused on what I'm trying to create for somebody who's giving me the opportunity and bless me to do something on their skin for the rest of their life. And I feel grateful for that too, because that's a big commitment. You know what I mean? It's like, these people are coming to me for something special. Um, so I, I take a lot of pride in that. You know what I mean? And yeah, we have a good time. Trust me. When you come get tattooed by me, man, it's, it's not your typical tattoo session. It's a, it's like you're hanging out at your friend's shop and you're drinking beers or, or drinking your Kool-Aid or whatever. You're just having a good time, you know? And uh, yeah. So I, I love that I'm able to do that. Cause if I didn't have that, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know where I'd be, Dave. I mean, <laughs> I hear you. I, I hear you. I mean, I, and I, I running just, circles in some parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it, uh, I get it. I totally get it. And I think everybody listening to this podcast gets it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that we're the lucky ones. We figured out where, you know, our happy place is. Have you ever had anyone? Cause here's why maybe half the reason I don't have a tattoo. Have you ever had anyone freak out in the middle and be like, I'm done. I can't take anymore. 
Oh, totally, dude. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, How comfortable so, is that, <laughs> dude? I'll, okay, so I was tattooing this guy. Quick story. I'll tell you another quick story. I'm tattooing this guy. I'm doing a skull on his arm, right? Uh huh. And I'm halfway through the skull, and this guy's like, he looks nervous. Like he starts off like having a good time, and then like he starts to get nervous. And I can tell when people get nervous because I'm touching them. I can feel them tenting up. Yeah. And I look up, and he just has like this like, like he's about to get hit by a car. Look in his face, right? And then he looks at me and he goes, I can't do it no more. I can't, I can't do it no more. And he just starts freaking out. Like, I can't do it. I got to get up. I got to get out of here. And I'm only like, the skeleton is only like to the bottom of the eye sockets. And I'm like, dude, I'm almost done. Dude, he throws the money on the counter and runs out. Never saw him again. I was like, what the, what was that? All? Like, he just freaked out on me. That was the one and only time I've had somebody actually like, freak out that bad and leave like just get up and leave he never saw him I mean, again he never came never. back I, didn't, I never finished it so there's hey, some dude, dude out, out there, there with <laughs> there's and some dude half skull. <laughs> there's some dude that is a half, what, what part of his body was it on it was on his forearm right here <laughs> so it's not like he could walk around and be like oh no look it's supposed to be half my face like no, <laughs> it doesn't work there, like that there's he's made a story guaranteed there's a oh, dude for sure. there that right now is like <laughs> Are you kidding me? You're talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I mean, we the half skulls. You know, we were a, <laughs> we were a biker band <laughs> outlaws, the half skulls. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if I told you the stories that I've had from tattooing in the chair, it's like everything from. From bikini tattoos to serious places in, in painful areas. I mean, you name it. I, I can tell you stories that we cannot publicize on this channel. That's for sure. But they are funny. Well, yeah, what's funny. the weirdest body part you've ever tattooed? The, uh, uh, the part where the poop comes out of. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> she was an exotic dancer. And, uh, yeah, she wanted a full string tattoo, full G string tattoo. All up, to, all up in the crack and everything, man. Like, in the areas. Wow. And I was like, this was awkward. And weird for me, but yeah, that's what she wanted. That, yeah. I would say that was the most craziest one. Yeah, well, because I kind of feel bad about <laughs> earlier when I said that freak fishermen, freak tattoo people are similar. I, I think that the tattoo people might be a little freakier. But whoa, whoa, whoa. Those are the clients, not the tattoo artists. Oh, yeah. The tattoo <laughs> artists are totally normal, aren't they? Yeah. Do you guys just yeah. put all that on your body for show? Like, just because, you I mean, you're... Is there any like famous tattooists that don't have a tattoo? I think that would be badass. Be like, I, I, I don't know, but I mean, I've gone to the, I've gone to the point in my age where I lasered a bunch of stuff off so I can have it redone. Like um, I lasered my whole arm off and having like a whole bass thing done, but I'm kind of liking like the not ha like I started lasering my neck off and stuff, as you can see, cause this is still dark, but. That's supposed to be like, really painful, isn't it? Like to laser it off is worse than getting it. I've heard. Is that true? Worse. Way really? worse. And then you smell like bacon cooking in the morning while you're doing it. So you're just like, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's extremely painful, dude. No fun. But, uh, but, yeah. But you're just taking it off so you can put some more on? Yeah, but the older I'm getting, I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I look good without tattoos at my old age. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll pass. And I got my, you know, I got my guys here that work with me that are like, come on, man, let's finish your neck. And I've had an appointment with my friend Goeth here for like, I want to do like some Hispanic culture, like uh, um, statues, you know, to represent like our background and stuff. And, but I'm just like, nah, nah, I just keep like putting it off and putting it off. Cause I'm just like, dude, it hurts. Like the oh. older you get, it hurts. I mean, it hurts to stand up all day going fishing, even at my age. <laughs> so I'm just like, you know, here I am trying to put, inflict pain on my body for tattoos. I'm like, oh, I think I'll just slowly get back into it again. Well, I, yeah. I think, I think what you've done with both tattooing and fishing and life has been pretty badass. And, and, and thank I you thank did. you for spending a little time with us. And, and I feel like, uh, feel like you're stuck. I feel like you got to come back here every once in a while. You were, you hey, were too whenever good. You want, I mean, man. like hearing <laughs> tattooing butthole stories. I mean, I, that's you. <laughs> Here's one thing I never thought we'd have in this show, a story about tattooed buttholes. But, hey, um, <laughs> we they're do. Half, 
somehow cross-referenced with fishing some way or not. Yeah. Well, Sorry, guys. Two- you can probably hear my phone ringing because I am at my shop at the moment. So. Yeah. Well, you better <laughs> answer that phone. Somebody Negative. wants a tattoo. No. <laughs> You got to email me to get tattooed. I don't answer my phone ever. <laughs> Isn't so, that weird uh, how nobody answers their phone now? Like when you were a kid, you would like the phone would ring and everybody would run. And now everybody like run, the doorbell rings and people run away from it. Like <laughs> well, who would come to our house without calling first? Like, how? Yeah. <laughs> it's you're strange. like, oh, uh, someone's at the door and the kids go run and hide. Everyone goes <laughs> and hide. Like if someone's like trying to come in the house. Yeah, dude, that's totally how it is, man. Like, but I mean, I guess we live in a day and age where texting is somewhat easier. I yeah. mean, for me, tattooing, everything is done through email because we got to like filter things out, like, you know, price. and What do you want? Is it possible? Especially when it comes to like the cover up tattoo stuff. Like I got to be able to filter that stuff out and, and not because I'm trying to be picky, but just because what's possible, what's not possible. Yeah. And if I had to sit there and answer the phone and, and answer emails, then I would never go fishing and I would never see my kids and I would never be able to do the million other things that I do. You know what and I'm you'd saying? never so, be happy. So it would be no negative. good. No good. <laughs> no. All yeah, right, man. All right. Well, you know what I'm bad at? I'm bad at ending these. So bye. <laughs> Peace. I told you you wanted to stick around for that one. Big Gus is a great dude with incredible stories and uh, most of all, an incredible heart. And um, I got a feeling Big Gus is going to be back here again because Gus is like an onion. I I feel like he's got layers, and and we need to unearth some of those layers, and we'll have him back here again in the future. But thank you for being part of this. And go, I'm going to put all the links to all this stuff down below. Let's, Let's impress Big Gus, okay? Let's really show out this time, guys. Everybody get there and buy these raffle tickets because you're not allowed to call them raffle tickets they're event tickets but uh, some great prizes i'll put a link down below go support it and show big gus that this show's a big deal so he wants to come back on here and uh that's all i got for you um like uh, most of my interviews end awkwardly this is gonna end awkwardly so have a good week enjoy being take it away uncle bob Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?